Bartleby the Scrivener by Herman Melville, 1853, read by Daniel Johnston. I am a rather elderly man. The nature of my avocation for the last 30 years has brought me into more than ordinary contact with what would seem an interesting and somewhat singular set of men, of whom, as yet, nothing that I know of has ever been written. I mean the law copyists or scriveners. I have known very many of them, professionally and privately, and, if I pleased, could relate diverse histories, at which good-natured gentlemen might smile and sentimental souls might weep. But I waive the biographies of all other scriveners for a few passages in the life of Bartleby, who was a scrivener the strangest I ever saw or heard of. While, the, while of other law copyists I might write the complete life of Bartleby, nothing of that sort can be done. I believe that no materials exist for a full and satisfactory biography of this man, as is an irreparable loss to literature. Bartleby was one of those beings of whom nothing is ascertainable, except from the original sources, and in his case, those are very small. What my own astonished eyes saw of Bartleby, that is all I know of him, except indeed in one vague report, which will appear in the sequel. Ere introducing the scrivener, as he first appeared to me, it is fit I make some mention of myself, my employees, my business, my chambers, and general surroundings, because some such description is indispensable to an adequate understanding of the chief character about to be presented. In premise, I am a man who, from his youth upwards, has been filled with a profound conviction that the easiest way of life is the best. Hence, though I belong to a profession, proverbially energetic and nervous, even to turbulence at times, yet nothing of that sort have, have I ever suffered to invade my peace. I am one of those unambitious lawyers who never addresses the jury, or in any way draws down public applause, but in the cool tranquility of a snug retreat, do a snug business among rich men's bonds and mortgages and title deeds. All who know me consider me an eminently safe man. The late John Jacob Astor, a personage get little given to poetic enthusiasm, has had no hesitation in pronouncing my first grand point to be prudence, my next method. I do not speak it in vanity, but simply record the fact that I was not unemployed in my profession by the late John Jacob Astor, a name which I admit I love to repeat, for it has a rounded and orbicular sound to it, and rings like unto bullion. I will freely add that I was not insensible to the late John Jacob Astor's good opinion. Sometime prior to the period at which this little history begins, my avocations had been largely increased. The good old office, now extinct in the state of New York, of a master in chancery, had been conferred upon me. It was not a very arduous office, but very pleasantly remunerative. I seldom lose my temper, much more seldom indulge in dangerous indignation at wrongs and outrages, but I must be permitted to be rash here and declare that I consider the sudden and violent abrogation of the office of Master of Chancery by the new Constitution as a premature act. Inasmuch as I had counted upon a life lease of the profits, whereas I only received those of a few short years. But this is by the way. My chambers were upstairs at number Wall Street. At one end they looked upon the white wall of the interior of a spacious skylift sh shaft, penetrating the building from top to bottom. This view might have been considered rather tame than otherwise deficient in what landscape painters call quote-unquote life, but if so, the view from the other end of my chambers offered at least a contrast, if nothing more. In that direction, my windows commanded an unobstructed view of a lofty brick wall, black by age and everlasting shade, which wall required no spyglass to bring out its lurking beauties, but for the benefit of all nearsighted spectators, which pushed up to within ten feet of my window panes. Owing to the great height of the surrounding buildings and my chambers being on the second floor, the interval between this wall and mine not a little resembled a huge square of Surston. At the period just preceding the event of Bartleby, I had two persons as copyists in my employment, and a promising lad as an office boy. First, turkey. Second, nippers. Third, ginger nut. These may, sound li these may seem names, the like of which 
are not usually found in the in the directory. In truth, the, they were nicknames mutually conferred upon each other by my three clerks and were deemed expressive of their respective persons or characters. Turkey was a short, pursy Englishman of about my own age, that is, somewhere not far from sixty. In the morning, one might say, his face was of a fine florid who, but after twelve o'clock, meridian, his dinner hour, it blazed like a grate full of Christmas coils, and continued blazing, but, as it were, with a gradual wane, till six o'clock p.m., or thereabouts, after which I saw no more of the proprietor of the face, which, gaining its meridian with the sun, seemed to set with it to rise, culminate, and decline the following day, with the like regularity and undiminished glory. There are many singular coincidences I have known in the course of my life, not at least among which was the fact that exactly when Turkey displayed his fullest beams from his red and radiant countenance, just then, too, at that critical moment, began the daily period when I considered his business capacities as seriously disturbed for the remainder of the twenty-four hours. Not that he was absolutely idle or adverse to business then, far from it. The difficulty was he was apt to be altogether too energetic. There was a strange, inflamed, flurried, flighty recklessness of activity about him. He would be incautious and dipping his pen into his inkstand. All his blots upon my documents were dropped there after twelve o'clock meridian. Indeed, not only would he be reckless and sadly given to making bolts in the afternoon, but some days he went further and was rather noisy. At such times, too, his face flamed with augmented blazonry, as if canicle had been heaped on anthracite. He made an unpleasant racket with his chair, spilled his sandbox, and mending his pens, impatiently split them all to pieces, and threw them on the floor in a sudden passion, stood up and leaned over his table, boxing his papers about in a most indecorous manner, very sad to behold in an elderly man like him. Nevertheless, as he was in many ways the most valuable person to me, and all the time before twelve o'clock meridian, was the quickest, steadiest creature, too, accomplishing a great deal of work in a style not easy to be matched. For these reasons, I was willing to overlook his act eccentricities, though, indeed, occasionally I remonstrated with him. I did this very gently, however, because though the civilest, nay, the blandest and most reverential of men in the morning, in the afternoon he was disposed upon provo pro provocation to be slightly rash with his tongue, in fact, insolent. Now, valuing his morning services as I did, and resolved not to lose them, at the same time made uncomfortable by his inflamed ways after twelve o'clock, being a man of peace, unwilling by my admonitions to call forth unseemly retorts from him, I took upon me one Saturday noon, he was always worse on Saturdays, to winter him very kindly, that perhaps now that he was growing old, he might be able to abridge his labors. In short, he need not come to my chambers after twelve o'clock. But dinner over, I best go home to his lodgings and rest himself till tea time. But no, he insisted upon his afternoon devotions. His countenance be became intolerably fervid, as he or ordicularly assured me, gesticulating with a long ruler at the end of the room, that if his services in the morning were useful, how indispensable then in the afternoon. With submission, sir, said Turkey on this occasion, I consider myself your right-hand man. In the morning I both marshal and deploy my and deploy my columns, but in the afternoon I put myself at their head and gallantly charge the foe with us. And he made a violent thrust with the ruler. But the blots, Turkey, intimated I. True, but with submission, sir, behold these hairs. I am getting old. Surely, sir, a blot or two of a warm afternoon is not to be severely urged against gray hairs. Old age, even if it blot the page, is honorable. With submission, sir, we are both are getting old. This appeal to my fellow feeling was hardly to be resisted. At all events, I saw that go he would not, so I made up my mind to let him stay, resolving, nevertheless, to see to it that during the afternoon he had to do with my less important papers. Nippers, the second on the list, was a whiskered, sallow, and upon the whole, rather piratical-looking young man of about five and twenty. I always deemed him the victim of two evil powers, ambition and indigestion. The ambition was evidenced by a certain impatience of the duties of a mere copyist, and warned in unwarranted 
your assertion of strictly professional affairs, such as the original drawing up of legal documents. The indigestion seemed betokened in an occasional nervous testiness and grinning irritability, causing the teeth of audibly grind together over mistakes committed in copying, unnecessary maledictions hissed rather than spoken in the heat of business, and especially by a continual discontent with the height of the table where he worked. Though of a very ingenious mechanical turn, Nippers could never get this table to suit him. He put chips under it, blocks of various sorts, bits of pasteboard, and at last went so far as to attempt an exquisite adjustment by final pieces of fold, folded blotting paper. But no invention would answer. If, for the sake of easing his back, he brought the table lid at a sharp angle well up towards his chin, and wrote there like a man using the steep roof of a Dutch house for his desk, then he declared that it stopped the circulation in his arms. If now he lowered the table to his waistbands and stooped over it in writing, then there was a sore aching in his back. In short, the truth of the matter was, Nippers knew not what he wanted, or, if he wanted anything, it was to be rid of a scrivener's table altogether. Among the manifestations of his deceased ambition was the fondness he had for receiving visits from certain ambiguous-looking fellows in seedy coats, whom he called his clients. Indeed, I was aware that, that not only was he at times considerable of a war politician, but he occasionally did a little business at the justices' courts, and was not unknown on the steps of the tombs. I have good reason to believe, however, that one individual who called upon him at my chambers and who, with a grand air, he insisted was his client, was not, no other than a dun, and the alleged title to eat a bill. But with all his failings and the annoyances he caused me, Nippers, like his compatriot Turkey, was a very useful man to me, wrote a neat, swift hand, and when he chose, was not deficient in a gentlemanly sort of deportment. Added to this, he always dressed in a gentlemanly sort of way, and, so incidentally, reflected credit upon my chambers. Rather, whereas with respect to Turkey, I had much ado to keep him from being a reproach to me. His clothes were apt to look oily and smell of eating houses. He wore his pantaloons very loose and baggy in, in summer. His coats were execrable. He, his hat not to be handled, but while the hat was a thing of indifference to me, inasmuch as his natural civility and deference as a dependent Englishman always led him to doff it in the off at the moment he entered the room, yet his coat was another matter. Concerning his coats, I reasoned with them, but with no effect. The truth was, I suppose, that a man with so small an income could not afford to sport such a lustrous face and a lustrous coat at one and the same time. As Nippers once observed, Turkey's money went chiefly for red ink. One winter day, I presented Turkey with a highly respectable-looking coat of my own, a padded gray coat, of a most comfortable warmth, and which buttoned straight up from the knee to the neck. I thought Turkey would appreciate the favor, and obeyed his rashness and obstreperousness of afternoons. But no, I verily believe that buttoning himself up in so downy and blanket-like a coat had a pernicious effect upon him, but on the same principle that too much oats are bad for horses. In fact, precisely as a rash, the rest of horses set to feel his oats, so Turkey felt his coat. It made him insolent. He was a man whom prosperity harmed. Though concerning the self-indulgent habits of Turkey, I had my own private surmises, yet touching nippers, I was well persuaded that whatever might be his faults in other respects, he was at least a temperate young man. When indeed nature herself seemed to have been his winter, and his birth charged him so thoroughly with an irritable, brandy-like disposition, that all subsequent potations were needless, when I consider how, amid the stillness of my chambers, the first would sometimes impatiently rise from his seat, and, stooping over his table, spread his arms wide apart, seize the whole desk, and move it, and jerk it with a grim, grinding motion on the floor, as if the table were a perverse voluntary agent, intent on thwarting and vexing him, I plainly perceived that for nippers, brandy and water were altogether superfluous. It was unfortunate for me that, owing to its peculiar case, indigestion, the irritability and consequent nervousness of nippers were mainly observable in the morning, while in the afternoon he was comparatively mild. So the turkey's pro proxisms only coming in 
on about 12 o'clock. I never had to do with their eccentricities at one time. Their fits relieved.